All right, so starting from chapter 2, verse 1. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. All right, so starting with verse 1 there, Richard Mellick is a new commentary I've been reading this week, and uh, he has a commentary on Philippians, and uh, the footnote is, is there on your, your notes, but um, he says this, Four statements form the basis of Paul's appeal to the Philippians. Statements are introduced by if in both Greek and English. Although the word if brings doubt to mind in the English, these uh, clauses express little, little hesitancy. They should be translated or understood more as assuming. So assuming then make my joy complete. It's like we would say to someone, if you love me, you'll do this or that or the other. So we're not really doubting their love. We're just saying, you know, since you say you love me, it is, it's manipulative. But um, Paul's not really being manipulative, but it's, but it's more along, that's more, he's not doubting his, their love for them, for him. And he, they're not doubting their, their um, encouragement, their comfort and their participation. He's not doubting any of that. It's reminder as much as anything. A reminder. A reminder, yes. Confirmation, yes. Yep. All right. So he, he, we have to remember, we have to read in context. And so we read the whole first chapter. Paul's talking about the blessing that they are, the partnership that they have. And so he's speaking to that. Right? He's speaking to what he confirmed and what he has mentioned and talked about his relationship with chapter one. So um, he's not here doubting it. So that's the point. Um so verse one says, starts out, if there's any encouragement in Christ, we're going to look at these three different things here. Um, so encouragement in Christ. Gordon Fee points out that this is another, another commentary I really like it's by Gordon Fee. And he points out that this statement is best understood as connected from Paul's prior sentence in verse 29 through 30. And 29 through 30 in chapter one says, where it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake engaged in the same conflict that you saw that i had and now here that i still have thus it could be understood together as if you are being encouraged by christ as you suffer for the gospel on his behalf at least that's Lord v's opinion um again the if does not express doubt paul is assuming that there is indeed encouragement uh in christ paul is meaning to gently encourage here unity you got something there, Nate? Look like it. No, I mean, I can, I can add that, like, those two words, that word for encouragement isn't, like, consolation. ESV is a good translation. It's not consolation, but excellent. Yeah. So it's not like a condolence. It's not trying to build you up. It's more of, like, have this Since there is this, that. No. Yeah. Great. And then the next statement here is any comfort from love. So Paul doesn't clarify. Notice here he doesn't clarify what love he's speaking of. He he doesn't, and lots of different commentators spend a lot of time talking about it. Um, but they pretty much all agree that he doesn't clarify. So he's not really saying, you know, if any comfort from my love for you um, to the Philippians, and he's not saying if any comfort from God's love for you, and he's not saying any comfort from your love for one another. So none of that's clarified. So um, that may indeed have been purposeful on the part of the apostle that he didn't clarify Why? what love is because it's all of them. Oh, filial, <laughs> all, all right. right. Go ahead. I'm going to say his. Hmm? Mine, the NIV says his love. His love. Yeah. Um, but his love from Paul or his love in you or his love one for one another. <laughs> All right. Um, so surely the, in the church of Philippi knew that Paul genuine, had a genuine affection for him. 
the apostle has certainly established in the gospel that uh, in that region with a message of the love of God in Christ. Right? So they have this relationship and Paul's whole message is about God's love for them. And finally, Paul's letter could be said to focus on the proper expression of Christian love. All right. Um, Gordon Fee, again, says the appeal in this context probably means something like if our common experience of comfort from God's love has anything going for it at all, then express that same love uh, by completing or express, express that same love toward me by completing my joy by having the same love toward one another. So um, it's interesting. We're going to talk more about even that statement, make my joy complete. Right. Um, but we're going to get there in a minute. So uh, the next thing is any participation in the spirit. Right. So notice the word before spirit. What is that word? Uh, the, which is what? So why, what, what is it? Why is that important to have the word the there? What does the do? It was talking about a specific. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 I read this whole sentence sort of in that context. It's almost like saying if you are experiencing any of these patterns. Yeah. 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 Good. Exactly. I, I may be interested. Uh, I see this as like a triune statement. Mm -hmm. You know, his love, meaning his father's, then Christ, and then spirit, he mentions it's a, it's a triune idea, or at least that's how I've thought of it over the years. It may not be true, but it, it, it works. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Look back here at uh, verse 27. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. And remember this in the Greek, he's, uh, the, the fact that Paul's talking about citizenship in heaven is much more clear. Um, so only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. So whether I come or, uh, and see you or I'm absent, I may hear of you that you're standing firm in one spirit with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Now, commentators and, and uh, scholars argue about that, that um, what is Paul talking about? Is he talking about the Holy Spirit there? Or is he talking about an attitude that you're that you're uni united in one attitude? But uh, regardless of whether if Paul's talking about that in verse 27 or whether he's talking about the Holy Spirit in verse 27, he is definitely talking about the Holy Spirit here, right? Um, the Spirit. Uh, the, the other thing with this, too, is the word he uses for prayer. Same word he uses in chapter one, verse five, when he talks about their partnership in the gospel. So it's not just participant participation in the spirit, it's participation with the spirit. it's partnership with the spirit. That kind of yeah, you got the hand motion going. That kind of well, well, yeah, that's it, a bond that is yeah, like, absolutely. Yeah. Amen. So fee here, I keep on quoting Gordon Fee, but fee here says that the fellowship with the spirit most likely refers to the sharing in the spirit that believers have first with God, but by that very fact, secondly, with one another. Because yes. they live and breathe by the same spirit. Um, by the spirit, therefore, they are united to Christ and in Christ to one another, and thus to Paul. So indeed, the spirit is the empowering agent of all that God is currently doing among them. The spirit becomes indwelling in them as they accept it. Yep. Amen. Yeah. And so we are united much more when we are with the Lord, when we are united with by to, to the Spirit, and we are and uh, we allow the Lord to have his will in us. We are united at a deeper level that we can really never understand if we just try to be united of mind. Right. Yeah. And then we just try to be try to work really hard to to be to have unity. It's, it's the, the level of unity that is within the body of Christ when, when all of us are being obedient to the leading of the Lord by the Spirit is at another level, right? I've, I've shared this in the past that um, we talk about fellowship often, um, like, oh, it's so good to get together in fellowship. And to me, that, like, always, it, it kind of just, you know, I never really correct it, but it was always in my head as like, ah, oh, that's not really fellowship, getting together and have a burger, 
Uh, so what's you talking about? In the, <laughs> well, yeah, it can be. Even even if you're not talking about God, you can still have amazing fellowship with someone um, in the spirit. Um, but here's here's the issue that when when we are let me clarify when I said even if you're not talking about that, that like I can be talking about my life and and what I'm going through and what I'm dealing with and when I'm talking with a brother or sister in Christ that is running after Jesus that is desiring his will in their life more than anything else then even the sharing of mundane things becomes a, yes. a, a, union, a, a deep unified fellowship however I could be speaking with uh, a Christian who is you know not interested in following the Lord um, and uh, which kind of drives me a little crazy but um, yeah. um, I could be speaking with a Christian who is who's just struggling with worldliness and carnality and and uh, they see their life in that way and even though we're Christians um, really all we're sharing is a burger you know, all we're sharing is is a meal together, and and that's not fellowship. That's not what God desires for us. And and what I what I've discovered is fellowship happens this way through the Spirit. That you fix your eyes on Jesus, the Author and Perfecter of your faith, and you run the way the race set before you that He has set before you. And as you're running that race with your eyes fixed, you notice there's a lot of runners around you. That are also fixed. Their their eyes are fixed on Jesus. And, <laughs> yeah, right. And, and, and you are running together. Yeah. And you're running together towards the same goal. You no, know, and you discover that as you're running, as your eyes are fixed, you discover that they're suddenly, hey, there are other people with their eyes fixed. <laughs> you know, and that's a beautiful thing. And that's what God desires for us. Nathan, did you have some? Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm misreading your cues. All right. It's okay. So, <laughs> um, all right. So any affection and sympathy is the next little section we're looking at. So these final traits have been have already been expressed by Paul as being shared in his relationship with the Philippians. And we've looked through at 5 through 8. One, chapter 1, 5 through 8. He says... Because of your partnership in the gospel, and Nathan talked about that. Nate talked about that. Sorry, man. I keep talking about Nathan. Because of your partnership in the gospel from first day until now, I am sure of this that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you because I hold you in my heart. For you are all partakers with me, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn for you with all affection, with all the affection of Christ Jesus. And when they speak of affection, I don't know what the Greek is there, but um, I think of servanthood. Yeah. You know, the, the servanthood nature that comes with the attitude of unity. You know what I mean? And empathy is supposed to sympathy out. Yeah. Um, uh, Silva says that it's, uh, it's defensible to render this tenderness. Um, he said, O'Brien argues that the focus is on divine qualities, but he extends that the idea, but he extends it by paraphrasing the passage saying, if God's compassion and mercy have produced those same qualities in you towards me, and you know I have toward you. That's good. Um, it reminds me of uh, just ministry in general. Uh, like this last week, I was at Summer Games. And, you know, these little kids show up and they're, they're, you know, little kids. And sometimes adults, we don't have the most patience for little kids. Um, <laughs> and uh, um, there's just something wonderful that happens as, as you place your, your life in the life of the Lord, in the hands of the Lord and, and ask him to use you to serve and really mean it. And uh, he begins to change the way you see people. And, and you begin to not so much have wonderful affection for everybody, but God begins to love them through you. And, uh, and we really saw that happening at Summer Games. It happens every year. 
that just um, the love of God is manifest in the body of Christ as, as they desire to serve these children. And then these children begin to show that to one another. Um, and it's just a wonderful, wonderful thing. Um, so these final traits have already been expressed by Paul as being, I shared, I talked about that already in, uh, in chapter one, verse five through eight. The obvious presence of these traits forms the basis of Paul's uh, gentle entreaty to this congregation, right? Um, we share all these things, thus make my joy complete. So verse two, he says, we share all this stuff, you know, so make my joy complete by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and in one mind. So Paul is already joyful over the Philippians. We see that. Um, but he's not in verse four of chapter one. He already mentions his joy. But now he's appealing that for that joy to be complete. So we ought not to forget Paul's circumstance while he's making this appeal to them. Uh, Paul is suffering for Christ in prison. And yet, what is his appeal to the Philippians for? He's, he's, he's not saying, work to set me free. Right? He doesn't say, you know, I have joy in you, but I'd really be joyful <laughs> if I got out of this prison. You know, you're not going to, you'd make my joy complete if you got me out of here. You know, that's not what he says. And I think that's really something. Um, so his, his, what does he ask for? His complete joy does not depend on the circumstance, but on their unity. Be of one mind. Um, Melek's commentary says this about this verse. The context of his exhortation is that they be like-minded. The verb used here occurs 10 times in Philippians, or 23 times in the Pauline letters, and it speaks to the intellect, the way of thinking, but it goes beyond that. It incorporates the, the will and emotions into a comprehensive outlook, which affects the attitude. So with this word and the context in which it occurs, Paul speaks of the values and ambitions which surface through the mind. This is unity. It is not found in an identical lifestyle or personality. It occurs when Christian people have the same values and loves. And so Paul sought this in the church. We talked about this last week, how, how the unity he's looking for is like unity of thought, unity of purpose, um, unity of... The goal. Yes, the goal. Um, and so just like at the illustration of running the race we just talked about, um, and so this is what Paul is talking about, that he wants them to be united in what they're living for. And so Melit goes on to say about this verse, three ideas combine to emphasize its different aspects. Having the same love as Christ did, having a harmonious affection, and valuing the same thing. I think that... Um, the thing is in... He mentioned people in love. Mm -hmm. So, worst one is all the good things the encouragement, the comfort, and the participation in the spirit. And all those good things are good, but all it's kind of like a loving parent that he's mm -hmm. away. Yeah. He wants it's not only the. Uh, you, he wants his children to care about each other, not just sometimes, I mean, you, you can speak the truth, you can try to encourage, but we have to do it in love for the relationship. That's most important. I, I think that's how he meant, I mean, or at least someone has to be joy when we complete. You're doing all the good things, very good. But then do it out of the love for each other. Do it out of the love the, for the relationship. That will make the loving parent. There's a way he cannot be with them. His joy will be, will be fully completed. And I, I think it, it's easy, I mean, in, in the church that we, we try to, I mean, I'll do the right thing for the others. But one thing that at the end, it, 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 we have to do it out of the spirit. When whatever, even the good things that we, we, we try to do, we pray to, pray to God first. And then so that we can 
say the right will at the right time according to God's will. Yeah. That will make That's sweet right. joy complete. Yeah. yeah, I think it's the whole will idea, the will of God, not our will, because our will will look will look at what you did. Did you say, Brian, lifestyle or what? Yeah, they're, 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 you know, they don't have the same. Yeah, worldly things to look at, even if we want to do good, but when you do it under the auspices of the will of God, it changes everything. Like you were talking about health, yeah. it changes it. Yeah, and sometimes yeah. we being parents, we we try to teach our children, and and I mean, like like. My mom, when she was still around, she trying to talk to talk to talk to us, especially the grandchildren. I said that well, mm -hmm. we we do it. We can do it. I mean, is it for just expressing ourselves, or we really want them to be doing the right thing? Because it's easy just throw it out. I mean, and and then, but we we have to. I accentuate the situation so that they are in in the temperament or in, 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 in the in ability to receive. Exactly, that's what yes. I'm trying to say. Yeah. No, yeah. I, no, no, no. I that's I, I'm I'm not good with words, mm -hmm. but I'm. I think you're very good with words. Yeah. No, yes. but I mean, yeah, that that's important. That because it's not just for my frustration that I express those things. But it's we we try to achieve the good goal, and that that's that's more important. Yeah. Uh, uh, also going along with your parenting uh, comments, um, character development is part of the love that the parent has for the child. You know, um, and so it's not simply get along for get alonging sake, <laughs> but that. You know, because that's easy sometimes, right? That, like, you just, you know, child screaming, would you just give her the toy? Would you just, oh, oh, yeah. just, <laughs> just let your sister have it, you know, <laughs> so she'll stop screaming and we can have peace? Learn. You know, and so you, you as, a, as a parent, you appeal to these things in your, in your kids, but... It's not just about achieving peace in the moment. It's about developing love and character in them for their life, you know. Um, and so, I, um, and so, Paul is 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 speaking to how they're treating one another and and their unity in Christ. But he's he's speaking for towards a purpose as well that he's desiring to see something developed in them. Uh, and so. Um, uh, Michael Baird or Bird and I don't know if I pronounce this word right or just name right, but Nijay Gupta. Uh, they have a new camp commentary uh, on Philippians called the Cambridge Bible Commentary. And so um, they say each of these words in 2 2 is important to Philippians as a whole. And thus, this verse, like 127, functions as another kind of master statement. First, Paul underscores what brings him joy it is not the removal of his prison chains. But ultimately, it is seeing his converts embody Christ-like humility, deference, and harmony. Second, twice in this verse, he focuses on the unity of mind. The word, or the verb, phronio, uh, uh, refers to a comprehensive way the mind sees reality and shapes the life and will towards this vision. This verb and related cognates are found throughout Philippians, as we already heard um, this verb be of like mind. So obviously, Paul makes much of how one sees the world, one's outlook or perspective. Paul was concerned that the Philippians were not properly under properly understanding the purpose and value of his and their suffering, and ultimately what it meant to glory in Christ and not seek glory according to worldly standards. Thus, he calls them gently uh, and repeatedly in this letter to come together in outlook and life to remember their heavenly calling and the citizenship. To represent that identity in their earthly life. This whole um, segment here, from, I get the impression that God is trying to tell me in suffering that this is all about how you look at any suffering, you know, as maybe not so much suffering. 
mean, you know what I mean? Yeah. That, that you don't characterize it that way. Yeah. Sure. And, and that you're not going through it alone, you know? Yeah. Um, and yeah. so Paul, even though he was more alone than the Philippians, did not consider himself alone. That's right. You know? So that he, he had the Lord with them, but he and and the people he, that were partnering with him there, but he also had the church capital C as a whole with him. So um, so I think it's important as we recognize, as we look at this, that we recognize the simple truth of Paul's appeal, that Paul does not simply desire that they all agree on whatever. Right? Just come together, you know, just agree on whatever. In the right way. Um, <laughs> and today in the, in, the, in the message, we're talking about faith. And I didn't add it to the message, but I'm, I'm reminded of this, this uh, movie that I like. And this, there's this dramatic scene where this pastor is dying. And, and uh, he, it's a sci-fi movie, and it's, it's set in the future. And this guy is a pastor way in the future. And, uh, and uh, the guy who's his captain for three years and years is standing over him um, trying to get help who did this to you and uh and uh, the pastor knowing that the guy who was his former captain doesn't have doesn't believe in god anymore says to him i don't care what you believe just believe <laughs> i was like what and that that's such a worldly way of thinking whatever you believe just be sincere about it that is not what paul is saying that makes no logical sense at all um, and it's not the message of the gospel. Just be sincere about whatever you believe. That's what people are twisting uh, biblical ideas towards um, to further their their worldly ideas. But that that makes zero sense. And that is not what Paul's saying. He's not saying just be unified just for the sake of unity, right? Um, he wants them to have the mind of Christ. He wants them to be committed to that which Jesus is committed to, right? He wants them to be committed to that which Paul is committed to, namely the knowledge of and the obedience to God in Christ and to the furtherance of the gospel. That's where they're to have their unity, right? That they are committed to what Christ is committed to. Like that is, that is uh, this is what Paul's talking about when he talks about unity. Okay. Um, and really, that's what comes down to uh, what heals our conflict w with one another. What heals our conflict in the churches is not like, hey, man, mine idea. Not your idea. My idea. My idea over your idea, Nate. You know? And once you agree that it's my idea over your idea, we'll be in unity together. You know? <laughs> that's not what does it, you know? Um, and, and actually, that's how the church has run, been, been run for a lot of years. They're, um, <laughs> that like, and I've been under guys who have been like that. And it's a tendency, it's a, it's, a, it's a temptation for any pastor to be like, hey, I'm the man. You know, once you realize that I'm the man, we'll be in unity together. You know, um, that is not what Paul is talking about. Right? He is talking about unity under Christ. Christ is the man, right? Christ is the boss. He is the one that we are to be conformed to. And it makes sense then that as we are conformed to the image of Christ, what becomes to what becomes with our separate di di divergent images, we become, we said to look more and more like one another because we look more and more like. Um, so Never think that when Paul's talking about unity, he's just talking, yeah, whatever. No, it's unity. Okay. So there is a there is a clarification that needs to be made to Paul's appeal of verse 27 now. Uh, the, the apostle is appealing to the Philippians to live as he lives for what he lives for. Right? Uh, live as he lives for what he lives for. Paul does not simply live as a citizen of heaven, he lives for heaven. Right? He does not simply live as a Christian. He lives for Christ. He does not simply live as, the, as a gospel witness. He lives for the cause of the gospel. This is his life. Right? Um, so all ownership and claims to Paul's motivation, desire, and influence, all of those things have been given 
over to Christ. And so he desires the same for the Philippians, right? Um, which is a strange thing if you think about it, that Paul is in prison going, I really want you <laughs> to be like me. He says other places, he says that to uh, King Agrippa. I would love you to be as I am, except for these chains, you know. Um, so uh, if there's no other comments, if there are other comments, that's great. I, we have time. <laughs> about his example. Yes. Be, the, mm -hmm. Not because he feels that there's anything in him mm -hmm. of, of value. You know, mm -hmm. that, I think that's Corinthians, but I'm guessing. Mm -hmm. you, know, um, you know, so that, and I think that comes through in everything. The action of his life, mm -hmm. I guess I'd say, you know. Yes. Isn't it yes. somewhere in scripture where he talks about this is me talking? Yes. You know, he does. Yeah. 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 So I, I think about that that's that's a humility issue. And so it's it's still made its way in scripture though. Paul says, yes. me, not the Lord. Yeah. And then he yeah. comes yeah. back and says, The Lord, not me. That's right. And so it's still made it in scripture. And Nate and I were just talking about this. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> Nate and I were just talking about this about Paul's humanity. Yeah. Um, and how it's it's evident in scripture um and how human Paul is, right? That he well, he wants to at one point and shows humility in another, shows love in another, shows anger in another. So go ahead, Mark. He wants them to feel the same joy that he feels. Mm -hmm. He feels joy in Christ that he wants them to have that joy also and they can share it. Amen. Uh, another thing, too, when we think about Paul, we are, especially today, we speak of Paul very high, right? We almost put, and I don't want to say this here, but I, I make a sweeping generalization. We kind of see Paul almost in the same light we see Christ, right? He kind of has been in the church today as a whole, elevated to that level. And that's kind of scary. But on the other side, what would Paul think of how we treat Paul? What would he think? He, I, I think Paul would be very upset by any sort of esteem that he was given. If we, if his, if his teachings to us don't cause us to have more of a kingdom perspective, don't cause us to to be unified under Christ, don't don't. That's his purpose, right? But if we think of it always, Paul was such a great guy. I want to be like Paul. Then we've missed the point. He, he actually says that explicitly. Yeah, he does. Yeah, that's 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 good. 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 Teach people from. Don't follow me. Don't follow. Me. Right. right. That's Christ. It's Christ. Yeah. And that's and that's what we have to keep focused on is yes, Paul has said all these things, and yes, they're inspired writings. But Paul knows that he, in the grand scheme of things, his kingdom-minded perspective that he's providing here is he's nothing. Right? Everything is for Christ, everything's under Christ, everything is to Christ. And if we keep that in mind when we read Paul, then Paul's writings don't point us to Paul, they should point us to Christ. You have to examine why Christians do that. Okay, that you have to look at the other side of the why do they do that? Oh, if I ever do that, Lord. <laughs> that I, I hope I have never done that. But um you you know, why do they do that? Because people look for heroes mm -hmm. and and that in and of itself is a deficiency in our thinking. And, and how that they're, it's not about heroes, it's about the truth. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And and um, I don't know if they think to be like Paul in his love for Christ. I can understand that mm -hmm. to, to have, but you have the main man. <laughs> so right. what would you? So I, I think we have to look at why. Right. I, I think, too, when we think about heroes, I, I don't disagree, per se. I no, think Christ is the... Cool. No, I think Christ is the ultimate hero if we're to talk about right. heroes. But, like, in our thinking, subconsciously, probably, Paul's an easier out. Yeah. Right? It's easier to be like Paul or to be like David or to be like Joseph than it is to be like Christ. So we're not seeking the image then. Right. We're missing, we're missing part of the picture. And, yes, Paul says... Be in, in, in First Corinthians, Second Corinthians, he says, "Be imitators of me as I am yeah. of Christ." I don't want you to imitate me for the sake of imitating me. I want you to see Christ in me and imitate that. 
So even when he says, be like me, he doesn't really say be like me. He says, be like me because I'm being like Christ. Yeah. We have As to remember a, that Paul is a human being and his emotions are human like ours. But on the other hand, we are going to have our own love for Christ that's going to be different because we're different. Mm -hmm. we, have uh, to, we have to feel that love like Paul does, but on the other hand, we're different people. So and, Paul's, uh, and Paul is going to be used in a different way. Yes. Um, and, Paul, uh, Paul is a servant of Christ. He is not equal. He is a servant. Mm -hmm. So Paul says in 1 Corinthians, he says, uh, I planted Paul's water, but God gave the growth. So neither yeah. he nor plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. Yes. Yeah. And so, um, and this is interesting that we're talking about this in Paul because the very next thing we're talking about is humility. Um, and uh, um, as we, I think one of the reasons we, uh, Paul might be elevated in our minds um, and we might seek to be like Paul is because we know that Paul, again, as it has been mentioned, we know that Paul is human and we can attain to the level of, of humanity in scripture. We can, we can be, I can, I can be as good as David. You know, I'm not going to cheat on my wife and murder, you know, so I'm as good as David is. You know, and even, even even though we're not, you know, even though we're not, I've never faced down a giant, you know, um, and and we can set up these uh, these heroes and be like, oh, I can do that, you know. But God doesn't call us to do something we can do; He calls us to do something we can't do. Um, he calls us to do something that only He in us can do. Yeah. Um, and so. Uh, Really, while we follow Paul because he's following Christ, we're really following Christ, which we can't do. Okay, um, but the Holy Spirit in us can do, and um, and and so this is this is again what Paul's talking about when he talks about unity, right? Because um, the Corinthian church was all divided up because they followed their teachers. They they looked towards opinion. They looked towards. Uh, teachings that they liked and looked away from teachings they didn't like. And so um, they're divided because of, of who they are uh, under, who they have placed themselves under. And so, and so Paul is speaking against that very thing that you need to follow after Christ and be united together in Christ. So again, back to that same point again, that it's not just about unity for unity's sake. It's not just about, uh, uh, you know, doing away with any difference of thought. It's about, Speaking after Jesus, right? Um, so Melek again writes, the second measurement is humility. Paul expressed this both negatively and positively. Negatively, the Philippians were to avoid selfish ambition and vain conceit. Selfish ambition motivated the creatures Paul described in 117. And so, uh, and so in 117, we, we hear about these people who are preaching the gospel out of selfish ambition. Um, and so perhaps this was fresh in his mind and it led him to think about conceit or the seeking of glory, which is in reality empty because it focuses on the individual rather, rather than on the Lord. Um, the positive side effect, correct improper attitudes, and they were to act in humility. So um, even though Paul says in, in that beginning that he rejoices because Christ is preached, that's not what he wants for the Philippians. He doesn't want them to preach out of selfish ambition or vain conceit just because Christ is is being proclaimed. Paul, that Paul statement there is, is really talking about his own attitude, that he is imprisoned and even and people are preaching the gospel, but he because the gospel is is being preached, even when they're preaching in wrong ambition, Paul's rejoicing. So Paul is speaking here um, about something beyond even that, that that they are united together in unity and of mind and they're, and they're not seeking their own ambition like these other guys, you know. Do you think this is a comment about Phariseeism and that there are some converted Jews in this, or does that not? I mean, I mean, I mean, we don't know the situation necessarily. I think really throughout the whole, what I think, all right, and I'm not going to teach this like this is actually what's going on in Paul's mind. What Brian's 
This is, this is, this is a what I think is that what we see in the whole book of Philippians is Paul, Paul's been giving these positive reports and has this wonderful rapport with this with this Corinthian, not the Corinthians, no, with the Philippian church that they are in partnership with him, they are sacrificially giving, but he also hears this that there's this division going on between these two women that are of influence in it. And that's not what Paul wants for Philippi. He doesn't want them to have any kind of division, any kind of uh, disunity. He, he sees where it could lead, you know, and he doesn't want that. For them. And so he's, even now, even the, from, the, from the very beginning of the letter, begins to talk about this, about what unity really means, and begins to talk about their call to, to, to run after Jesus, to serve one another. And because in the back of his mind, he's got what could happen. You know, um, what he's seen happen in, the, in other churches, this unity come in, get its roots, and tear the church apart. Um, and he, Paul doesn't want that for, for the Philippians. And so the whole, the whole letter, you see Paul speaking to uh, what it means to, 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 to serve Christ and to serve one another. And at the same time, talk about the joy he already has in them, right? And so, so that's what I think it is, that, that even though he only really brings out and says their name towards the end, he's really been speaking to it the whole book. Right? When you want to bring a message, um, aren't you driven sometimes or, or shown some light, some aspect of Christ or some aspect of follower of Christ. Wow, wow I want to share this with you. And I, I think there may be something going on because we'll look at where he's writing from. Mm -hmm. What what circumstance imagine cause someone to consider themselves? Mm -hmm. He has been brought low. Yeah, exactly. And so he's seeing the, the joy of that, trying to help others see it. And isn't that a, just a strange, not worldly way of thinking? Right. You know, yeah. I've been brought low, yay! You know, what a wonderful thing that, that when we're brought to the end of ourselves, we realize how wonderful God is. And uh, I am uniquely reminded of that today as I'm exhausted from summer games. <laughs> and uh, I and uh, my own words are coming back to bite me, and Jeff Jeff just reminds me of that uh, I said to the to the huddle leaders on Wednesday, like Wednesday is really kind of when you start getting, you know, um, and you start snapping at each other, and and uh, Thursday, Wednesday, and Thursday of, of a of a mission trip week or a service week, yeah. And I told them I love Wednesdays and Thursdays. I love it when my team begins to snap at one another. Like, well, that doesn't make any sense. But I love it because it means you're getting to the end of you. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and God wants more for you than what you can do. And God wants to do more in you and through you than what you can do. And really, you're getting to the end of your rope. And in actuality, that's what God wants us to be. He wants us to live at the end, at the end of our rope. Knowing that even if we were not at the end of our rope, it's a better place to be at the end of our rope and let him do the work than to do it out of our own strength. Well, everything still depends on him. Mm -hmm. if, if the attitude, yeah. Yeah. you know, the being of one mind. I always think the being of one mind is with mind. Yeah. And we yeah. fool ourselves into thinking that that our own willpower our own our own polish you know our own goodness our own professionalism is enough um but jesus said i will build my church right. will my church not me not you him in us um so and it goes back to that parable of the of the sowing uh the sower that sows the seed you know all we can do is do what we're told <laughs> You know, and God does the rest. He grows it. He grows the seed. Um, and we just obey and go to sleep. Follow. Oh. <laughs> oh. 
What's that? Yeah. Said trust and obey. Trust and obey. Yeah, I think that's if you look at Paul's purpose of Philippians. I think Brian and Jeff both hit on it pretty pretty solidly. Is providing this perspective, right? Which is not necessarily just his own perspective, but something through his trial mm-hmm. is be like Christ, kingdom minded. I think is the best way. To well, his experience proves God. Right. It proves it. It's mm-hmm. the proof. And yeah. it's something he doesn't see in Philippi. There's the, the issue of ladies earlier, and there's the issue of the gift, mm-hmm. and there's all these other issues that are probably going on that he's aware of that, that are not specifically mentioned, but that they're being like, they're doing the right things, it seems like, but maybe their motivations for doing the right things aren't quite there. That's yeah. where Paul wants yeah. to refine them. The, yeah. Like, I would consider if we started ranking churches, and the Philippians are kind of up there, yeah. right? As far as like <laughs> yeah. being more like Christ than the Ephesians, if that's fair. That's probably not fair. But, Learn us first. But, <laughs> but, on the flip, but on the flip side, they're not, they have not arrived, right? Yeah. They aren't, they have not reached that fullness of Christ. Now, I don't think Paul has either, but his idea is to continue to help them grow. Yeah. Not, there should be no stagnation in our growth from from rebirth to death, we should be continually growing mm-hmm. in the life of Christ. Even considering that, mm-hmm. to have that mind among you, you mm-hmm. know, to yeah. consider that. Paul was yeah. Paul was insanely smart. Yes, Paul was, was very educated and yes. argumented very, very beautifully sometimes as far as the way he puts things together and bookends things mm-hmm. like the beginning and end of books. Very it's fact. So the, there's a Kind of sum up what Nate said there that um, that really what we're seeing going on here is motivations and not just action, right? Um, and that's kind of the whole book of Philippians is really a, not the whole book, but a lot of it is talking about motivation. Um, and really, it, that's a uniquely Christian thought. Really, um, the world is kind of wrapped up in attitude, and uh, even even in religious circles, not not in, in action. And even in religious circles, sometimes we think it's just action, you know, just, you know, don't smoke, don't drink, don't chew, don't dance, <laughs> um, you know, uh, and then, and you'll, you'll be right with God. But Jesus brings a, a whole different idea yeah, into go. the picture, yeah. you know, um, and, and this is why, this is why it's so dangerous to equate Christianity with morality. Right, Christ makes us moral, but Christianity and morality are not the same thing. Right? If if God was concerned only with morality, it, it makes me wonder why didn't He send Jesus into a time rampant with immorality? But He sent Christ into probably the most moral period in Israel's history, um, and uh, with with rules to help them obey rules. All right. Um, and and idolatry was being punished by death. You know, worshiping a false of false idols was um, was recorded in history of being punished by death. And this is what Israel used to do. You know, there used to be rampant idol worship and ra- and rampant pagan worship. But now we don't see that in the time that Jesus comes. You know, and so there's this there's this real desire for for uh, doing the right thing before God, doing the right thing before God. And here comes Jesus with you got it wrong. upping it up uh, or ramping it up and saying, you got it wrong. So it's the not thing just... Is, their morality made them stiff and unhappy, and God wants us to have joy. Mm-hmm. Our relationship with God should be joyful. And they make happy by their relationship with God because it was too stiff, too moral. Well, if morality would have gotten it done, all we would have needed is the Ten Commandments. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Obviously, yeah. they didn't get it done. Yeah. And, but Jesus comes into this scene saying, yeah, it's not just enough what you do. It's why you do it and who you are on the inside. Yes. Yeah. You know? You, you, um, when you give, don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. Give, but you know, don't do it for you or for anyone else, because it's my right hand, right? That's what we usually 
That's usually what we forget. We're like, oh, that's just talking about in secret. No, it's not just talking about giving in secret. It's talking about keeping record in myself as well. Don't let my left hand know what my, or don't let my right hand know what my left hand is doing. Don't rack up in my points. Man, I, <laughs> you should have seen what my left hand was doing. I was pulling money out the wall left and right. No, it's about the inner humility before God. Everyone who hates his brother is a, is a murderer. And you know that eternal life does not reside in a murderer. Paul's words to the Corinthians, the first Corinthians 3, 1 through 9, say, talk about motivations too. He says, uh, but, but I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now you are not ready for it. You are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are not are you not of the flesh and behaving in a human way? For one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Paulus. Are you not being merely human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? We read this already today. Service to whom we believe does the Lord assign to each. I planted Apollos water, but God gave the growth. So neither he nor plants nor he who waters does anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers, and you are God's field, God's building. Gordon Fee writes, As with humility, this does not mean that one should falsely consider others better. As verse 4 will clarify, we, which we are so to consider others, not in our estimation of them, which would only lead to very vices Paul has spoken about, but in our caring of them, in our putting them and their needs ahead of our own. Um, after all, this is precisely how Christ's humility expressed itself. As Paul narrates in verse 8, thus it is not better that others in the community are to be thought of as, uh, is not, fee he is talking about this verse that what it really means is that it's not so, that the others in the community are thought of as better than I am, but that their needs and concerns surpass my own in my mind, right? That I, that I treat them and their needs first. I take care of their needs first. So these thoughts seem to harmonize with the literal Greek, which reads in humility, one another. And I'm just going to read what the Greek says. And, and the sentence structure is different in the Greek, but just, Listen to what it says. In humility, one another be esteeming, surpassing themselves. Right? So be esteeming, surpassing themselves, which would seem to echo Paul's statements in Romans 12, 10, love one another with brotherly affection. And then he says, out to do one another in showing honor. Right? So out to do one another in showing honor. So we need to keep moving. We're only got like four minutes here. Um, um, let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. In the Greek verse, so uh, in the Greek verse, uh, one through four is one sentence. Um, Paul's thoughts here are connected. So verse four is a continuation of the thought of three. We are to we are to act in humility and esteem and esteem others above ourselves by looking not only to our our own interests but the interests of others. Um, it is interesting to note here, however, that this is that considering. Of other people's interests is not is also done within the context of uh, of the one mind that is set on the kingdom. Okay, remember what we talked about humility, oh, not humility, about unity. That unity is the one mind that is set on the kingdom, and so this is all this is connected. When he when Paul says look to the interests of others, he's it's still talking about the unity that is set on the kingdom, and so the looking out for others' interests should not be understood as their interests that may be sinful or self destructive or harmful to others. Right? You're not there to support them in whatever they do. Okay. This is not what Paul intends here. Rather, as the body works together in one mind set for the kingdom, there ought to be no self-glorification, no positioning, no politicking for personal power. The body, rather, is to care for its own as its own, to provide all the various parts of the body, their particular needs in order to function in the body as Christ has called them. That's what it's talking about when he says, look to your own interests. He's not saying, you know, that really selfish guy, make, make sure you appeal to his interests. You know, that person who needs a lot of patting on the back, make sure you give it to him. You know, yeah. that person who is always uh, rude to other people, 
make sure you give them space to be rude to other people. That's not what Paul's talking about. He's not saying, uh, you know, take care of those worldly in- interests. That is not what he's saying. He's saying love one another enough so that you provide what each needs and what each uh, needs to serve the Lord, right? Um, and sometimes that's going to be different, difficult. And sometimes people will say, you're not taking care of my interests when in fact you really are, all right? When in fact you're giving them exactly what the Lord needs as the Lord leads you to give to give it to them, right? Well, um, when you're serving God through other people, it has to be a warm and caring relationship. It can't be something cold and legalistic and distant. Exactly. It's, yeah. It has yeah. to be warm. And that's what we see in Philippians with Paul. That is it's not this cold, legalistic, distant relationship. He's got a, a warm affection and love for this church. Diana or well, yeah, you can't do it when you were uh, quoting Romans. You can't do honor unless you really care about them, especially if there's somebody you don't like. Mm-hmm. You're not going to like, you know, what we're commanded to love. So the only way to do show honor to people who need pats on the back or want to be rude mm-hmm. with the ears and um, it's actually unkind to let that pass. It's, it's you're letting injustice, how can you show honor when you're letting injustice reign? I see it as an injustice to, to not, I mean, you talk about a truth and love, you know, honor, honor is a, you know. So looking out to one another's interest, taking care of one another is a lot different in the mind and the body of Christ and ought to be um, different than it is in the world, right? Mm-hmm. Um we love each other more than what than we love how we're viewed, right? Uh, we love each other more than than um, warm fuzzies that people get when we speak affection into their life. We love them more than that. That's not to say those things aren't needed. That's not to say we aren't called to be gentle. That's not to say we aren't called to be careful <laughs> in how we correct, right, or how we love. Um, but... We love people in the body of Christ so much that if we ourselves are, are to be put on the, on the altar as a sacrifice so that they might benefit and they might be drawn closer to Christ, so be it, right? Um, because I, Paul is encouraging Philippians here, my own interest might be to never love someone in such a way that I'm called to correct them because... If I'm looking out for my own interests, I really want them to think highly of me. I, I, you know, and my own interest is for everybody to say, man, I love that guy. He just makes me feel so good about myself. He is so gentle and so kind and so loving. I just love him. And I sit back and go, yep. But you think that way, but in the back of my mind, I know, but you think that way because I've never said this, 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 this that the Lord called me to say. Mm-hmm. And I've never done this, 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 and this that the Lord called me to do. Because I knew if I said those things or did those things, it would be against my own self-interest. No. But, but take it another step further. Really following Christ. Seeing mm-hmm. a hard truth for brother doing they're gonna they're gonna yes <laughs> they won't maybe <laughs> they will if they're following right that's my yeah point. yeah if they're following unity that's supposed to work together we're supposed to be able to yeah. hear hard truths and here here's the uh, taking it we're, we're over time but taking this a step even further that that requires even more than just the the initial verbalizing yeah. and being brave and, and saying, okay, Lord, I'll say what you've called me to say, which is essential. All right. There's a lot of there's a lot of checks that need to happen in our spirit before we can yeah. say that. You don't do it we, judgmentally. We can't correct unless we're willing to be corrected. We can't yeah. we can't teach unless we're willing to be taught. All right. Um, and so you feel corrected? <laughs> no. <laughs> but here's here's the thing. Um, that the correction that God calls people calls the church to give one another and the and the encouragement that God calls to give one another and the and the and the looking out to one to others' interests that God calls us to give one another is not a 
uh, dropping a bomb and walking away type of, That's type right. of thing. Um, it is the, it is the, yes. And it's, it's saying to the, to the brother and sister in Christ, I know this is hard to hear and it's hard for me to say, and, but I know the Lord is leading me to say it, but I'm going to say it because I love you and desire God's will for you and not just say it, but I'm going to be, I'm going to make myself available to you to walk this out. You know, I am here to carry you through this. I'm here to bear your burden yeah. with you. Um, um, I know, I know that it's a struggle. Um, it's a struggle for me. Uh, and, uh, you know, I desire to be there for you to help you have what Christ desires for you. And in order for you to really do that, you need to show a pattern of doing that in your own life that, that you say to, to other people and you, and you show, you show it, not just in your words, but you, you show it in your witness that, that, um, I struggle with this, 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 and this, and I need you to come along and correct me, hold me accountable and be there for me through it. You know, um, when, when you do that, God's going to use you to, to do the same for others. And, and Christ is the goal.